Hi, good morning. Um, if you can close the door. Um, hi, welcome. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Omer Van Kluten. I'm a staff, staff software engineer from uh, WeWork. I work for WeWork, not at WeWork. And uh, I work out of the Tel Aviv headquarters in Israel. And I come here today to talk to you about types, surprisingly enough. Uh, I've been doing Scala since 2012 um, and have some insights and I want to share them with you today. So let's start with something a little upbeat. Everything is terrible. Um, we are human and to err is human. So we have typos, we have bugs, we have regressions. We keep saying it works on my machine. It doesn't work on any other machine, it just works on mine, so that's enough, right? And I want to show a graph here. This is a graph that depicts the cost of fixing an issue over the lifetime of a system. <coughs> so you can see in the beginning it's a requirements all the way to operation and it grows, the cost grows. But I want to um, point out a couple things here about this graph. One is that it's logarithmic scale. So the graph is a logarithmic graph. And the other thing I want you to know, notice is that this is from 1981. So this has been known for a while now. But this is a solved issue, right? We've solved this. We, we've pushed a lot of the checks back because we have unit testing. And unit testing is awesome. It finds our problems really early on in the software development lifecycle. It also helps us refactor with confidence. And it documents our usage. If someone wants to know how to use our APIs, all they have to do is look at our dot tests and read and see what works, what doesn't. But unit testing is also less awesome because there is more code to write. And there is more code to review and maintain. There's so much code. There's code bases where it's like six times the amount of production code in testing code. And it's code, again. So you're not going to test your unit tests with unit tests of unit tests. That doesn't make sense. Moreover, it's not exhaustive. Because 100% co test coverage is a lie. If you have 100% code coverage, you cannot be 100% confident in your code. And the last thing is that it's poor documentation. Because all of us in our jobs read code. It's hard. It's much harder than writing code. It's mu much harder than reasoning about something we already know. So tests are poor documentation for someone who doesn't know what, you're do what your code is doing. Another thing is that we're seeing divergent behavior. We've got, let's look at our documentation here. So we've got a documentation for a function, a method. It connects a cat to all veterinary clinics. Cool, that, that makes sense, sure. Uh, it has one parameter, which is the cat ID, and it returns the number of clinics connected. So I guess all of you now can kind of imagine what that function looks like, right? And you know what it does. But then the, the code, it kind of looks different. It also gets a clinic ID, and it returns a Boolean. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. And the test says that a cat may not be associated with more than one clinic. So how, what? And are there exceptions? This is a good case. We, I've seen much worse. I'm sure all of you have as well. So what if we could have some sort of compile time annotations? and we could enforce our invariant business rules. Things that we know are not going to change, or if they are, because everything changes, it will cost us a lot to change our code for that. And it could replace our most basic repetitive docs and tests. As a result of that, our users could be impacted in a way that they could discover fa failures really early when they're developing. And they can understand where those validations of those rules happen. 
surprisingly enough, those are types. I'm sure I'm not, <laughs> not telling anyone anything new, right? Um, so let's look at the first step. Let's take a new example and work our way through it. So we have a connection class. I'm sure most of you have seen something like this. And we have a host and we have a port. But both of them are anything, just anything. We started without types at all. So is this a good thing? Who thinks it's, this is a good thing? Nice. Who thinks this is a bad thing? Seems unanimous. But th it is a good thing. And I know saying this <laughs> in a room uh, packed of Scala developers may not be wise at a Scala conference, but this is a good thing. It depends. So Kent Beck defines um, three stages of every business's software. It has explore, expand, and extract. When you're exploring, then you're like, what even is a host? I don't know. I'm exploring my domain. I'm exploring my business. I don't know what I'm supposed to be writing. I don't, I don't have any invariants. Things are super fluid. So at this point, not having types might be the right thing because types would hold us back. Refactorings would be painful. Writing new code would be painful. Next up, we have expand, where we got to go fast. We've succeeded with our business. We've found something. And now we have a ton of users. Um, something like Pokemon Go, if anyone remembers what happened with that a couple of years ago, where they su massively succeeded and broke. Everything broke. They were fire fire firefighting all the time. So it's somewhat of a good thing, because that's not your focus, but not necessarily. And then you get to the point, if you succeeded, to the point where you extract, where you extract value out of what you have already. At that point, you want to start growing teams. You want to start refactoring a lot more. That's painful. And be, you're building new things on top of shaky foundations because you've written code so fast, you've accumulated technical debt, and now <laughs> you're writing things on top of that pile of flaming uh, garbage. Uh, so let's see that again, OK? Um, we're going back to our connection class, and let's try and see how we can add some types to this. So let's look at the port, right? If it's any, then I can give anything. It could be a future. Um, let's try and constrain our domain. Then we have any val, which is, I guess, any value like minus 2.0. That's still not good enough. That's not a port. So we go to int. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sure this is very obvious to everyone that an integer is as closely related to a port as possible, right? So we have our connection class, and our host is a string, or port is an int, sure. And now we have to write some documentation, and we write this huge thing on top of it that uh, the host is an IPv4, here's the RFC, and the port is a 16-bit unsigned integer, and we had exceptions. Because if we get an invalid port or invalid host, then we had exceptions. And now we have to react to them as the caller, as someone who is creating the connection instance. Then now I'll have to catch exceptions. And they're both the same type. So I have to figure out which one it was, parse a string, whatever. This is not a nightmare. So let's try and constrain our domain further. How can we make sure that it's even more constrained? and only contain values, valid values of ports. For that, we can use something called refined types. Refined types are a library where you can write something like this. It's an integer refined to be a closed interval between 0 and 64k. That's nice. It looks nice. A string could be refined to be IPv4. What does that even mean? That means that if I try and call the connection class, create a inst an instance of the connection class with something that looks like not a host and minus one, it would fail to compile. It wouldn't fail at runtime. It would fail just to compile, even. You cannot write this code. But this is kind of cheating, right? 
uh, because <laughs> we're getting input from users. We're not using constants all the time. So for that, we have a macro. Um, and this macro, what it does, it, it refines our integer that's maybe a port. We're not sure. And it gets back an either of string of por port, where the string is the error. Something has happened. This is not a port. Or you can get a port. So in this, we have achieved that we know what has failed. We know why it failed and when it failed. And we are being proactive, not reactive. We're not catching exceptions as a result of something that happened, but we are checking the values to make sure that they follow what the function signature is. So refine types are a library. As I said, it's on GitHub. They're type level combinable predicates. So you can write something that's like list of integers where all of the integers are positive and it's not an empty list. And this would be checked at compile time. This is very, uh, very nice. It has all these um, Boolean operators. And it has an ecosystem. So if you're using a library now, something like Play or Cersei or something like that, that has a refined types library for it. So you can start using it immediately. On top of that, there is a ton of predicates. I'm not going to go over them. But you can see there is stuff for Boolean characters strings, collections, everything, right? And these are all validated at compile time. So what have we achieved? We've achieved a change, a transformation from runtime exceptions to compile time errors. We've moved things further up in the uh, lifecycle. <coughs> We're obligating our callers explicitly. We're making sure that we're documenting our preconditions so that the callers are obligated to uh, supply the correct type. And if they can't, then they have to handle that. We are writing less code. All of those tests that we used to check that these uh, preconditions were met, we can delete them now because they won't compile, right? The tests themselves won't compile, so it's OK. We can delete them. And we've also stopped checking in our own code whether the values meet the criteria that we want. So we're not throwing exceptions anymore. And we're automating all of this using the compiler and macros. So let's look at a couple of exercises for us right now. Um, the first one, we're going to try and work our way through an example and add some types to it. So the first one is a wagging tail. We have a uh, wagging tail of a dog, and if you pet the dog, you get its wagging tail. That, that's how dogs work. <laughs> but we can return the wrong dog, because we can just pet our dog, and some other dog would wag its tail. That doesn't make too much sense. Um, so we can use path-dependent types, where we place our class inside another class, and if we try to pet a dog, we can create an instance of a dog type, a dog type's wagging tail type. No, now we have to use the instance's type. So it's depending on the instance and not on the type. This means that we don't have, we don't have any other dog that we can just pull out. And even if we did, the type signature doesn't allow us to return any other dog's tail, just our dog. And if we have a dog, or original dog, and we pet that dog, the dog that we pet is the same dog, and that's guaranteed at compile time. So that's a very simple example of just using types to take away some need from documentation and tests. Um, let's take a short interlude and talk about something that's not directly code. Um, what can't we statically type? We can statically type anything outside our type system. That's uh, the I.O. barriers, mostly. We're talking about things like network, our database, our file system, our operating system. These are all things that live outside of our little world of types. So what can we do to solve it? We need to do two things. 
The first one is we need to choose better abstractions. Those abstractions will take that, um, that burden of checking that things and uh, types are related and they will make sure that we can keep our little world of types where they take care of the crap that's going on. <laughs> Another thing we need to do is write integration tests. If we are writing tests for things that are integrating outside of our type system, outside of our uh, runtime, we need to write integration tests. There's no two ways about it. And that means that tests are never going away. I mean, the premise of this talk was we need to reduce tests, right? We can reduce tests with types, but they are never going away. We still have business rules that cannot or should not be expressed through types. So things like validations are a natural fit for types. The port to port is a valid port number. Uh, the tail we got was what the one of the dog that we pet. And there are things that we don't want to express in types because that would make our code unusable or it's not possible, like complex business rules. Let's look at another exercise. This is a one a bit longer, and we'll go through a journey here where we'll start with something that's completely um, without specialized types, and we'll build it as we go. So we want to pet a dog. We send it a dog ID. That's cool. We send it a cat ID. We get bit. You don't pet a cat like a pet a dog. So you get a bite exception. How do we stop getting exceptions? How do we codify this through types? So using tests doesn't work. It's too late. I mean, the test passes, right? But our users, they're not safe. They can get bit. So we can use something like ID types. These are just case classes. We've got them extending an eval, so they're a value type now which means they have a very small footprint, almost, in uh, almost no footprint. And we have a dog, and the dog has a dog ID. That's nice. And when we pet a dog, we ask for a dog ID, and not just any integer. That means that petting a dog and sending it a cat ID would just not compile. That's great. But we want a dog ID to be an ID, because it is an ID. Right, it's an integer, so we want it to be an integer. Um, if we have something just accepting IDs, just generally accepting any ID, then or printing it or whatever, we still want it to work. So we ex we want to extend, we want to use the ID. So we have to do dog ID dot ID because the ID is the field inside the dog ID class. And so that's cumbersome. Uh, can we use implicit? Uh, I guess, sure, uh, we've got an extract ID, and that's an ID of a dog, and doing ID to ID, but then we have a ton of other animals, and that's super annoying. So another thing we have is accidental creation. I don't want just anyone creating cat IDs, right? I want to create them from a centralized place, I want to have control over who creates cat IDs because someone using my code and saying, okay, this accepts a cat ID, sure, I can just create a cat ID out of nothing, throw that in. <laughs> so we changed that to having a private constructor, yay, success. Um, but they can still accidentally create that cat ID by having a, a cat and copying it and replacing the ID internally because there's the people will do things if you don't let them. They will find a way. <laughs> so we can use a trick that's a sealed abstract trick. Uh, who knows the sealed ab abstract trick here? Okay, so very few people. So um, sealed abstract means that you cannot, abstract means you cannot create an instance of this type. You have to extend it. Sealed means that if you want to extract it, you have to be in the same file. What does that mean? That means that only something in the same file can create an instance of this type. So I have this. The supply function is in the same file. It creates a cat ID. 
and it's private to the persistence layer, my persistence layer. So that means all, only my persistence layer is allowed to create IDs. That's really awesome. And I can add some business logic here as well. I can check that the ID is correct. I can check multitude other things. That's really cool, but it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because if you remember, my cat ID is, an, is, an, is a value type and you can't extend a value type. Small bump in the road. Um, let's try something else. Tagging. Uh, so tagging is just taking an empty trait and saying, this is the trait. Done. Okay, so if I have an ID, I have an ID that's 10, I just do as instance of dog, uh, sorry, int with dog ID. And then there's zero runtime overhead for this, almost zero runtime overhead for this. And I can use this as an, a new kind of type because querying with an int with a dog ID does not send, let me send just an any int. It let me send only things that are tagged with a dog ID. So an int with a dog ID is still an int. So we've solved that issue completely. There's zero runtime overhead because we're as instance of to something that has little or no impact. And accidents are less likely because doing a distance of in your code is discouraged in Scala. So it's gonna, it's gonna pop up. Um, there, there's a convention for this and that it's uh, at at, so it's int at at dog ID, if you ever see something like that. And please don't roll your own. There are multitude implementations here, and all of them catch the issues that you haven't even thought of yet. So please don't <laughs> write your own. Uh, there is in shapeless and scala z and so on. But this isn't convenient. So let's try something else. We can try new types. Who here knows what a new type is? Okay, so five people. Uh, so new types come from Haskell. What they are is uh, zero runtime cost wrappers. <laughs> what does that mean? That means, and you can see the at new type on top of that, that means it's a macro in this case. And this is what it looks like. We don't care. You can read that later. But it, what it does is it looks like a case class. It functions like a case class, but it's actually tags. So we're getting the best of both worlds in this case. This is really nice. It's a library. You can see it. It's on GitHub. And it's coming to Scala sometime. It's SIP uh, 35. It's called opaque types in Scala. This is really nice. Really hoping for it. Um, but we have a problem here we are still not using the same capabilities that we had with tagging, which is that a dog ID is still an integer. That's really solvable by just changing it to new subtypes, new subtypes. So now it's a new subtype of an integer. So a dog ID is now also an integer. That was easy. And there's even the ability to add our own implement, um, sorry, our own creation and our own business rules, but just taking away the case from the case class. This means that we have to generate our own constructor. We have to generate an apply function or any function that we choose on the companion object. So to recap, this is what we have so far. We have our new subtype and we have our own constructor. And when we create a dog ID in our persistence layer, it's an, it's an integer, but it's still its own type. But we need to go deeper. And let's talk persistence for a second. If we're talking about CRUD implementations that pretty much everyone here has, we have our querying that gets an ID. We have our deleting that gets an ID. We have our creation that gets an object, uh, sorry, an update that creates, that's an object with this ID, and we get a create with what? So that, what do we do? Do we make our IDs optional? Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense because we want our IDs. 
And what even is an ID? IDs on implementation details. There are our, usually our persistence layers. You, uh, they, they are used in, by our persistence layer to identify an object. Okay, so let's separate those concerns out. Okay, we have a new case class. It's called dog with ID. It has a dog ID and an entity. When we query, we send an ID. We get a dog with ID. When we update, we send a dog with ID, and we get a dog with ID. And when we create, we send just a dog, and we get a dog with ID. That looks great. Let's make that generic. So now we have a with case class that gets an entity and an ID. And it does the same thing, but just generically. I want to switch it over to an infix notation. What I'm going to do is exactly the same as this, but it looks nicer. So we have an entity with ID instead of with entity ID. It's the exact same thing. Okay. Uh, types can have infix notations as well. And let's wrap it up in a repository class, because we all love repositories, and give those types there. If you want to read more about this and how to use that in your persistence layer, there's a blog post here that you can read, and it shares how to do that. <coughs> but there's a problem here. And the problem here is that we can create a repository of a dog and a kid ID. So pff, that doesn't really work that well. So what if we could have a typed connection between a dog ID and a dog? What if the compiler would not let, uh, let us create that dog and cat ID? So back to our example, we're creating some trait that says represents. Okay? So we have an identifier which represents an entity. And now we require that whenever an instance of the with type or an instance of the repository type are created, they have to, you have to supply some sort of evidence that the ID actually represents that entity. And that means that once we have that implicit in scope, we cannot even create those instances. We can't create a repository of a dog and a cat ID, or a cat and a dog ID, or if we have a dog and a dog ID, we can't create query by a cat ID, because all these things are caught at compile time. So to recap the whole thing, um, we have our new type, which is wrapping zero, it's a zero cost wrapper around our um, instances and our IDs, that is. And we have some sort of implicit evidence that only a dog ID represents a dog, so we can create a repository. All this is completely typed. This is really nice. So what do we want to take home from this? Well, the first thing, there's a lot, of, a lot to learn. Um, there, this is a photo op, so you can take a photo and just learn all these things later. So I'm going to pose. Hopefully you're done. So there's path-dependent types, uh, self-recursive types, and so on, and so on, and so on. And there's uh, existential types with the little asterisks on top of that, because some of that is going away in Dottie, so be careful. Uh, but just some. Um, so we need to figure out just to which tools do we have that we can use in our own code bases. And But first, we have to have the compiler be stricter. Please turn on dash x fatal warnings. Who doesn't have dash x fatal warnings in their code base? Who doesn't have? OK, that's the first thing you need to do when you go back to the office. Please do that. <laughs> People will hate you initially, but will thank you eventually. Um, and please, please use a linter. One or a combination of all of those. Um, they are super helpful with finding things that are type, type level errors that are not caught by the compiler in its default mode. I have an entire talk if you want to see that. It's called Power Up Your Build on creating more robust, predictable builds. And the last thing I want to share with you is that what we've created here is we've increased our robustness. Things are failing less 
And when they're failing, they're failing really fast. They're failing even before we've started running our program. And we've used very simple tools to do that. And apart from that, we've replaced a whole swath of tests and docs, not all of them. But we are now we're focusing on the right ones. And if our docs and tests exist, and I hope they do, then they are very focused on the things that matter. And now you ask yourselves, where can my code benefit? And more importantly, should my code benefit to any to what degree should my code benefit? Right? Thank you. So, questions? That was very clear then, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, there's a question over there. Okay, there's uh, a question over there as well. Uh, thank you for the talk, it's very interesting. My pleasure. I wanted to know that in your production code, uh, uh, how much of these rules are you uh, follow actually following, or you are restrictly following these rules? for mm. all the business logic, or are you just pick some of them for the important things? Uh. Yeah, so as I said, it depends. And it depends on where in the life cycle of your application in terms of business you are. So my current project is very initial. So we have a proof of concept ready, and we have really uh, um, we're still exploring the domain. We're exploring the business. We're figuring out whether we're even building the right thing. So we've taken a step back on types because that's not the right thing for us right now. But the previous system that I wrote, um, I implemented a lot of that and used many of those tricks because that was a system that was expanding. And we were, sorry, extracting. We were extracting the value out of it. So. I used more and more of those and could then rely more on my system. Wait. Um, sorry, I would be better if everyone could hear it. Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't quite catch why you weren't using re refined types for the things you did after, like your new types and everything. Why I wasn't using refined types yeah. instead of new types? Yeah, for uh, example. There are different use cases for what we're trying to do here, right? We're, yeah. we're trying to codify a new type of business entity and not just uh, implementing well-known rules on top of that. Yeah, but maybe your, your dog ID is not um, an int, but a UUID? If it's a UUID, that, that's yeah. great. Just change it to a UUID and that's done. And everything just ripples through the system when you compile it. Great. Thank you.